Okay, 7.30. Okay, well, it's 7.30. I guess we'll go with uh, what we got right now. And if anyone else decides to show up, uh, I will let them in. Okay, so welcome. Uh, my name is Jeff Robertson, uh, past president of the Edmonton Center of the RASC, and this is What's Up Over Edmonton. And I will share my screen here. Share sound. And There we go. Okay. And this is a picture of the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium, which uh, for those of you who don't know, was the first public planetarium in Canada and it opened in 1960. Uh, original intention when we came up with these uh, Wednesday night sessions was we were going to hold them in uh, the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium, which uh, would uh, be operated by the TELUS World of Science, which is that building off in the background to the uh, right of your picture. Um, however, COVID came along um, and uh, the building is not quite done. TELUS is not taken, uh, taking it over from the city. Um, so but hopefully in the new year. And then we'll do these things live uh, over at the QEP and uh, afterwards, if, uh, if it's nice out and if it's dark enough, we could go out and have a look at some of the things we're talking about. Call this What's Up Over Edmonton because uh, sitting here at 53 degrees north latitude, our sky is a lot different than uh, what I see uh, in uh, publications like Sky News or Astronomy or even talked about on the CBC. Uh, for example, this is the uh, sky at 11 p.m. Uh, from Toronto on July the 5th. And the constellation I point out is uh, Scorpio. That's it right there. It's fully above the horizon. Um, but in Edmonton, um, this is all we get to see. First off, at 11 p.m. on July the 5th, the sky is a lot lighter uh, because it never gets dark. Uh, that time of year and Scorpio never gets higher in the sky than here. So you never get to see the tail uh, of the scorpion. Most of the information I use comes out of the RESC's observer's handbook. It's a wealth of information, several hundred pages uh, with um, all sorts of stuff in there. Uh, monthly sky charts, uh, uh, eclipses, sunset and uh, moon rise times, um, all sorts of stuff. It's an invaluable resource. Uh, I refer to it uh, constantly. So uh, those of you who are here for me, uh, we'll do a little bit of review. Uh, one of the things I was talking about was May uh, would have the uh, best evening apparition of Mercury this year. And I'm wondering if anyone got out to see it. This is uh, a picture I took on May the 10th. Uh, you see the uh, waxing crescent moon and Mercury right there. There's an arrow pointing it out, a little bit of cloud. I wanted to have a little bit of uh, foreground uh, trees just to give it some context. So uh, I watched Mercury over several nights uh, getting higher and then uh, starting to sink um, in the sky. And uh, it's always a thrill to see Mercury because uh, it's a very tough planet uh, to see because it never strays all that far from the sun. And the other event uh, we talked about was the uh, lunar eclipse, um, which uh, I got up early in the morning. Uh, however, uh, this is not my picture. This is a picture Alistair Ling took. I'll put his credit there. Um, about 4.30 in the morning, uh, you can see the partially eclipsed moon up there disappearing into this bank of clouds. And uh, 
from where I was, uh, it disappeared into that bank of clouds about 4.30 and never came out. I was hoping it might pop out of the bottom, but no such luck. So at five o'clock, I called it a night. Uh, it was, uh, dawn was only uh, 20 minutes away. I said, well, I guess I'm uh, not going to see anything more. What I really wanted to see was uh, stuff uh, Alistair and I talked about last month was if we would even be able to see the fully eclipsed moon because it would be very close to the horizon and the sun would be coming up and the sky would be very bright and uh, we might not be able to see the moon. So I was really curious to see if that was the case. However, clouds got in the way, never got to see it. So some of the highlights in uh, the sky for June 21, 2021 are long days, endless twilight and no mosquitoes yet. Although I'm noticing um, a lot of yellow jackets flying around and usually you don't see those guys until later on in July and in August when the food supply starts to run down and uh, that's when they start coming around. But uh, I'm seeing a lot now and I'm thinking because there's no mosquitoes because it's been so dry here, they're hungry and they don't have anything to eat. Anyway, enough of the uh, wasp talk. So the summer solstice is on uh, June the 20th and it's at 9.32 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time, the longest uh, daylight of the year. Early risers uh, can see Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, they're well-placed in the uh, southeast morning sky. Uh, once the... Uh, moon disappeared into the clouds. Um, I uh, took a few views of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, well, hey, I was up, right? Uh, we have perpetual twilight, of course, until the end of July. Uh, so look for noctilucent clouds. Uh, there's already been some reports of them. Uh, we had uh, one right at the end of May, which is very unusual. Usually uh, we start seeing the more commonly in June and then July, for some reason, uh, July 1st usually delivers us a very good display in past years. And uh, it's with perpetual twilight, it's prime viewing time for satellites. I have a hot tub in my backyard and I go out there and sit in there and rest my aching back. And it's uh, nice watching satellites pass over, you know, not just the ISS, you see all kinds of them going, uh, west to east, north to south, all sorts of satellites going on every which way. Um, sunrise today, uh, just for interest, it was at 5.09 and it sets tonight at 9.54. At the end of the month on the 30th, it uh, rises at uh, 5.08, sets at 10.06. And just for information on the solstice, the sun rises at 5.04 in the morning and sets at 10.07. So I am just going to start the recording now. Okay, this is the uh, sky tonight, uh, June the 2nd, and I have set the clock for 11 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. If we look into the uh, west-northwest, uh, we see Venus just above the horizon, Mars uh, a little higher up in uh, Gemini. It uh, crossed through Gemini last month and it is making its way to Cancer. If we follow the ecliptic uh, through Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, and there's uh, Scorpio, uh, the Scorpion just coming up at, uh, at dusk with its bright star Antares right there. Uh, Antares is a reddish star and it means rival of Mars because they are of a similar color. Why don't I name some of the stars here? There we go. Uh, name some of the brighter stars. Uh, Regulus, Spica, Antares. Pollux and uh, Castor, which doesn't have a name. I guess it's not dark enough yet. Uh, right on the horizon is uh, Procyon, which is uh, now setting 
uh, from its appearance in the winter. If we look up, we see uh, Ursa Major, the Big Dipper uh, asterism, still occupying its spot uh, almost directly overhead. You follow the arc of the handle down to Arcturus, and then you spike down to Spica. That's a little uh, poem you can name also. If you have any doubt about Capella, if you follow the top of the dipper, it will point at Capella, the very bright star in the northwest at sundown, and throughout the night it will make its way across the northern sky. Now the northern sky, uh, as we're now in perpetual twilight, uh, never gets completely dark. <coughs> Advancing through the month, let's just go uh, one day at a time. See Mars making its way. Venus is uh, hanging in there. It's uh, climbing up um, the moon. Oh, I missed that here. The moon is right next uh, to Venus on the 11th. However, it is very, very thin, uh, only about 2% illuminated. It'll be very tough to see. It'll be easier to see the next day on the 12th, where Venus is about a degree and a half to the south of the moon. The very next day, the moon has uh, gone past Mars, and it is about um, Mars is about three degrees south of the moon. And as we follow the moon through the month, and I'll just shift over here. To the 23rd and then the 24th. Oops, went the wrong way. 24th it is full, and so at 11 o'clock it is uh, just rising uh, above the horizon there. Also uh, Saint Jean Baptiste. Continuing on through the month, um, let's go back and watch our planets here. Mars is continuing. Uh, to set, uh, I should make a note here. I'm just going to zoom in on Mars here. Whoops. And go back a couple days. There we go. Now, you're going to need binoculars to see this. I, I, I just think it's going to be too light uh, to see with the naked eyes. But binoculars may bring out uh, the beehive cluster. Mars passes through the beehive cluster. If we make it a little bit later, let's make just before midnight. Uh, oops. Uh, Mars is... you need a very clear horizon there. Uh, the sky is a little bit darker, but and Mars is right on the horizon. So give it a go. Switching to the morning sky, and I have uh, set the time for 4 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, the 3rd, uh, because the sun is coming up at 5, and uh, any later than that, uh, just about everything you're seeing here would be uh, wiped out in the glare of uh, the rising sun. So we uh, see a line of planets. We see Saturn, Jupiter, and Neptune. Uh, also, the... Uh, First, the last quarter moon uh, is in the sky uh, near Neptune. Neptune, of course, is a telescopic object, but uh, you, know, you might want to try for that. Uh, or any time this month. I mean, it's not going anywhere. Uh, Saturn, uh, at the beginning of the month, is rising at uh, one twenty-six in the morning. Uh, Jupiter is rising at 2.02. Uh, by the end of the month, uh, Jupiter is going to be rising at 12.18 and Saturn at 11.39. Looking up, uh, we see uh, many of the uh, 
familiar constellations that we'll be uh, looking at in the fall. Uh, we see uh, the Summer Triangle, uh, which is Deneb, Vega, and Altair. Here I will do my asterisms. There we go. And uh, they are uh, placed at this hour uh, pretty much where they're going to be uh, at uh, sunset in uh, September, October, almost directly overhead. So we'll uh, talk about them a little later. There's, uh, there's our old friend Pegasus, the upside down flying horse. Uh, Perseus, the hero. And uh, Capella, which at the beginning of the evening was in the uh, northwest sky, has made its way uh, to the northeast sky. So if we watch the planets uh, through the month, and I will just advance this a day at a time. You can. Uh, See the move, there goes the moon. Oh, and I should also point out that uh, Uranus is uh, starting to uh, make its appearance uh, for another year in our sky. Incidentally, uh, Saturn uh, reaches opposition, uh, and that is when it will be uh, rising at sunset on August the 2nd, and Jupiter will reach opposition on August the 20th. So, uh, throughout the month of September uh, would be a good time, uh, if you have a telescope, small or large, to uh, have a look at Jupiter and Saturn. Oh, here comes the moon. On the um, 27th, which is here, uh, the moon is near Saturn, and then on the following day, it is near Jupiter, and then two days after that, it is near Neptune on the last day of the month, on June the 30th. Now, um, I'm going to change the time slightly because um, although the odds of seeing anything are pretty slim, uh, Mercury uh, is starting to pop out. And like I say, we're, we're not going to be back here until the, July the 7th. So if we go to July the uh, fourth, whoops, went by one day, uh, Mercury is at its greatest western elongation. Now unfortunately it uh, is a much better view from the southern hemisphere than it is from the northern hemisphere, but if you have a flat horizon to the uh, northeast, uh, you may have a chance to spot Mercury in the constellation uh, Taurus the Bull. I should also mention that um, Earth is at Apahelion, which is its furthest point from the Sun, on the 5th of July. Now I can't let June go by without mentioning the uh, summer solstice. Uh, this is a photograph uh, that I've shown before, and it's uh, taken by uh, one of our members, Luca Vanzella, a uh, past president of uh, the Edmonton RASC, and it shows the sunset path of the sun throughout the year over Edmonton. On the far left uh, is the sunset path of the sun on the winter solstice, and then uh, throughout the year to the uh, one in the middle, which is the sunset path at the equinox, either fall or spring, and continuing uh, further to the right 
Uh, the furthest one to the right is the sunset path of the sun uh, for the uh, summer solstice. So you can see the uh, the sun does move from uh, uh, north to south uh, throughout the year. Uh, once it reaches its uh, point on the 20th, uh, it will start to move back toward the south. So I would have thought I would just throw this in um, for the solstice. So there are uh, no meteor showers uh, of note in June, and um, there aren't any visible comets that I am aware of at this time. So um, not to be a Debbie Downer or anything, uh, June is not the greatest month for uh, stargazing because like, uh, the nights are so short and it never gets completely dark, but uh, there are a few things uh, to see. So that's it for the planetarium section. <laughs> What do you see when you look at the moon? When it's full and round, do you see a balloon? Does it look like a cookie with a bite taken out? What do you see when you look at the moon? It okay, the uh, for the moon this month, third quarter is, well, was this morning, June the 2nd. The moon is new on uh, June the 10th. Uh, first quarter is on the 18th, and the full moon is on the 24th, and it is known as the strawberry moon. It's also known as the hot moon, the rose moon, the mead room, or the rose moon. Uh, the lunar feature of the month, and I always try and take something out of the Explore the Moon Certificate Program, which is um, put out by the RASC. This is a page out of the binocular version, and uh, it is uh, something I would encourage uh, anyone to try. Uh, and uh, if you complete the certificate program, they'll send you a certificate and a pin. So last uh, month I did Clavius, which is right down here. This month I'm going to do uh, Tycho, which is right here. Uh, the crater Tycho uh, was named after the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe. Uh, who lived between 1546 and 1601. And he was known uh, for uh, mapping the stars and the planets, particularly the movements of the planets in very precise uh, detail. And uh, it was those uh, uh, recordings that he made uh, that allowed Johannes Kepler, uh, who was a contemporary of his, uh, to write his laws of uh, planetary motion. Uh, the previous picture was a nine day old moon I took uh, a few months ago. This is a 10 day old moon I took last month. And again, there's Clavius and there's Tycho. Uh, the crater is very young. It's uh, only 108 million years old, uh, which is young for anything on the moon. And uh, this dating was based on samples uh, returned uh, from Apollo 17 of the ejecta that was thrown out uh, from the crater. The crater is 86 kilometers wide and it's a very deep crater. It's uh, 4.8 kilometers deep and it is in the uh, Southern Highlands. And it is an easy target in binoculars. It starts to uh, show itself on day nine and 10 after new moon, but is not as obvious as it will be in a few days. And there we go. This is the full moon. And there is Tycho right there, this big bullseye almost. Uh, 
it's the nature of the surface of the moon is when the sun is uh, shining directly overhead uh, of an object on the moon, it reflects light uh, uh, tenfold back to us here on earth. So this, uh, uh, instead of just seeing the crater, you see this massive ray system and this ray system uh, goes almost around the entire uh, visible surface of the moon. Uh, you can see it's shooting out, out far to here, out far to there. Whatever hit the crater must have been fairly large, coming in a fairly good space. It probably came in almost straight down um, uh, to create this uh, ray system, which is um, uh, almost concentric. Oh, there's my arrow. <laughs> Okay, here's some close-ups of uh, uh, Tycho is uh, taken from lunar orbit from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. As you can see, it has a uh, terraced walls. It has a large central peak. Uh, this comes from a rebound uh, uh, when the impactor hits and compresses uh, the surface. It the uh, the surface uh, pushes back and rebounds and forms these central peaks. And uh, you see the central peaks in a lot of large uh, impact craters on the moon. This is it taken from a bit of an angle. And this is a close up of the central peak. Um, during the Apollo program, uh, a lot of scientists wanted the uh, uh, NASA planners to uh, send a mission to Tycho, but um, Tycho was so far away from the equator of the moon, uh, which is uh, where they wanted uh, the Apollo missions to land because it's easier to get there, it's easier on fuel. And also uh, the terrain was so rough, uh, the mission planner said there was no way in hell Apollo was ever gonna go to Tycho. Now, last month I uh, chose Clavius because it's featured in uh, the movie 2001, well, so is Tycho. Uh, Tycho was the site of uh, TMA-1, uh, Tycho Magnetic Anomaly, uh, or, or the monolith, which you see there. So uh, Tycho made itself uh, into the movies. Okay, uh, the constellation of the month is Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, uh, or as we refer to it, the Little Dipper. So um, here is the little dipper here. Uh, you can see Polaris, the handle of the dipper and then the bowl right there, but let's put some lines in it. So there you go, easy to see. Seven stars, uh, the most famous star of course is uh, Polaris right here, the pole star. Uh, to find Polaris, you uh, find uh, Ursa Major or the Big Dipper, find these two stars here called the pointers and just draw a line and the bright star that these are pointing at uh, is Polaris, the North Star. Uh, there are only three stars of the Big Dip or the Little Dipper or Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, there we go, uh, that you can see in the city. The light pollution wipes out the rest and uh, you'll see Polaris and you will see uh, uh, Furcad and uh, Koshap, uh, the two stars at the end of the uh, end of the bowl here. Uh, you have to go out in the country away from the city lights to see the entire uh, constellation. And uh, there's a little uh, representation of uh, the little bear with its long tail, even though bears don't have tails. And uh, which brings us to the mythology of uh, Ursa Minor and also Ursa Major. Um, there are a, uh, several myths. Uh, the Greek myth was that uh, Zeus, who was uh, king of the gods, who never had a, an uncle Ben to tell him, teach him that with great power comes great responsibility because Zeus was always cheating on his wife. And uh, he cheated on his wife, Hera. And uh, his wife found out about it. And so Zeus 
changed his uh, mistress and her child that came from that relation into bears and uh, grabbed them by the tails and uh, threw them up into heaven, up into the heavens, so Hera, his wife, wouldn't kill them. And that's how the tails stretched out. So that's one of the myths. Uh, now, Greek myths aren't the only ones. Uh, the Cree people who live around here uh, have a myth. Uh, and they call these uh, stars the dog stars. And their story goes that the people didn't have protectors to warn of danger approaching particularly at night from wandering animals or even invading nations. And Mikam, the wolf, sent two pups to live among the people. And they quickly became the companions and the protectors of the people. The coyote and the fox saw what Mikam had done and sent two pups of their own to the people. And these pups became the dogs we know today. And to acknowledge what the animals did, uh, the creator placed a reminder in the heavens of the dogs. The handles of the dogs represent the wolf, the coyote, and the fox. Polaris being uh, the wolf, coyote, fox. And the four stars in the bowl uh, represent uh, the... Uh, dogs uh, that went through the four directions of mankind. Uh, as I said, Mikam the wolf is Polaris and uh, it anchors the leash as the dogs run around the circumference of the sky camp throughout the night. Those are uh, a couple myths. I, I, I like the Cree story better than the, uh, the Greek story. <laughs> and uh, as I said, these three stars that have the names attached to them are the only ones you can see in the city. You have to get uh, outside, you know, go to the Beaver Hills Dark Sky Preserve out near Elk Island, uh, or in Elk Island actually, and uh, if you want to see the whole whole thing. Um, and maybe wait till the end of Perpetual Twilight too, uh, and then you can see the uh, all seven stars. Now, uh, because Polaris, uh, the pole star, is part of Ursa Minor, it, it gets a lot of airplay. I've had a lot of people come to the observatory where I volunteer, or used to, until we closed it down for COVID, thinking that Polaris is the brightest star in the sky, which, of course, it's not. It's uh, the 49th or the 46th, depends who you talk to. Anyway, there's a quote here. Uh, from Julius Caesar, Act 3, Scene 1. I am as constant as the northern star of whose true fixed and resting quality there is no fellow in the firmament. Now, um, is Polaris really constant? Well, in, in the lifetime of a human being, yes, it is. But uh, this is the sky in 44 BC with the year that Caesar was assassinated. And there is this grid pattern represents uh, the sky, the celestial pole is right there. Polaris is offset uh, quite a bit. But advancing it today, we find the uh, Polaris has moved very close to the celestial pole. And this is as a result of uh, what we call precession, which is the Earth's wobbling on its axis. And it does one wobble every 25,000 years. So uh, in a few hundred years, Polaris will be as close to the celestial pole as it's going to get this cycle. And then it will start to drift away. And I think in about 13,000 years, uh, Vega will be the closest bright star to the pole. Uh, so there, there's something to look forward to. <laughs> Other highlights this month. Now there's an annual or solar eclipse. It'll probably get a lot of uh, play in the media, but it's not visible in Edmonton. Um, the uh, sun has not risen yet. An annual or eclipse is when the moon is uh, too far away from the earth to cover the entire disk of the sun. So you see a, a ring of the sun around it, a ring of fire it's sometimes called. Um, annular uh, meaning, uh, meaning ring. 
So as I say, you'll, you, you'll see a lot in the papers. Uh, it is visible in, in uh, Ontario, Toronto, center of the universe, et cetera. Uh, but uh, so it'll probably be in a lot of the papers and on the newscast, but it will not be visible here. So uh, the moon passes uh, north of Venus on uh, June the 12th. Venus is low in the evening twilight. I pointed that out in the uh, planetarium portion. And it passes Mars on the 13th. And it's in the beehive. This is all covered in the planetarium section. And uh, also Saturn and Jupiter. Now, we do have noctilucent clouds and uh, this is prime season for them. Uh, this is an image I took uh, from my front street, right in front of my house. And you see these uh, electric blue clouds. They are lit by the sun, which is uh, below the horizon, but not very far below the horizon. These star, these clouds are about 80 kilometers up. Uh, there's the bright star Capella right there. Um, now, what causes these is, is probably ice crystals high up in the atmosphere. These things are about 80 kilometers up in the atmosphere. And, uh, you know, I, I, I see reports that uh, it's uh, water collecting on meteor dust and, and such. Now, the thing is, is there was no record of noctilucent clouds uh, before 1885. Now, England, Scotland, the Scandinavian countries, they're on the same latitude as we are. They see the same sky as we do. And they didn't see any noctilucent clouds. So something we're doing down here is pumping stuff high up into the atmosphere to cause these things to form. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's probably meteor dust with ice on them, but it's not just meteor dust with ice. There's something else going on too. And I've got a little movie that, uh, I showed a movie last month. I'll show another movie that one of our members took of uh, noctilucent clouds and you can see them moving. This is a time-lapse obviously. because these things do move over time. They're not as uh, jumpy as the Northern Lights say, but they do move over time. And we see an approaching cloud bank. This is how you can tell if it's noctilucent clouds or not, because if it's regular clouds, they're gonna look black where noctilucent clouds will be glowing. Okay, I'm gonna move on to our space history section. Now, last month, I, I always post these things on YouTube a couple days after, uh, but uh, my, uh, my video was blocked for copyright reasons. And I thought it was because I used a, a clip from a 35 year old PBS documentary. It turned out it was the song I put on the opening of my space history graphic, which is gonna pop up right away, over 60 years old someone put a copyright stop on it and uh, kept the video down. It, I fixed that. The video is now on YouTube, but um, the sound is going to be a bit loud. I will fix that for next month. So here we go. Pretty cool, eh? <laughs> Overly dramatic. Please come on. Here we go. Okay, uh, the International Space Station is uh, the largest item in orbit around the Earth. The first piece was launched in uh, November 1998, and it was completed in 2011. Uh, there was a significant break in there after the uh, Columbia accident. Uh, because uh, the large pieces needed the space shuttle to uh, haul it up into orbit. Um, now, when I say it's completed in 2011, they're always adding bits and pieces to it. I, I, the Russians are uh, going to be putting a, a fairly large piece on it uh, later on uh, this year. The first crew to uh, 
occupy the station on a continuous basis, uh, that is a, a regular six month rotation, it was in November 2000 and it has been in continuous occupation ever since. So almost 21 years there have been people living on the station. But uh, the first off, occupation of a space station was 50 years ago this month on June 7th, 1971, um, Salyut 1 was occupied by a crew of three Soviet cosmonauts uh, for 23 days. Salyut 1 was launched on uh, the 19th of uh, April, 1971. It is uh, 20 meters wide or 20 meters long, uh, four meters wide at its widest point and weighed 18,400 kilograms. Now it had one docking port on this end here. It had a, uh, the living space was this part here. It had uh, two sets of solar panels, which uh, were taken from a, a regular Soyuz spacecraft, uh, two at the front, two at the back. And actually the propulsion module is actually the, the service module from a Soyuz that they modified and uh, attached to the back of this thing. This is a photograph of uh, Salyut 1 taken from orbit uh, by Soyuz 10, which was the first um, craft to visit it. Now Soyuz 10 was launched on April 22nd and they were using a automated, an automated docking system. And uh, when uh, the uh, craft docked with the station, uh, the thrusters uh, started firing wildly and they, uh, jammed the docking mechanism and they couldn't retract uh, the uh, probe on uh, the orbital module. Now, um, I'm just gonna stop this for a second here. Actually, no, I think you guys can, hang on. Now I'm, I'm gonna stop this for a minute here. Just so you can see my face here. So this is a little model of a Soyuz spacecraft. I, hopefully you can see this. And it's three parts, there is uh, what they call the orbital workshop at the top. Now the docking uh, system is at the front. Now this is this docking system here on this little model is for the Apollo Soyuz. It wasn't the same they used on Soyuz, but you know, the docking se section goes at the front. Back here, this little bell-shaped part. This is the um, uh, ascent and descent module. This is uh, the part that uh, the cosmonauts ride in when they're launching and coming back to Earth. This is the part that comes back to Earth. And this bit at the back is the service module, which contains uh, the batteries, uh, the oxygen, the, the rockets, and of course, these two solar panels. So just so uh, we know what we're talking about here. Uh, when, uh, when the uh, Soyuz re-enters the atmosphere, this top part flies off, this model doesn't come apart. Uh, the orbital modules jettisoned, the service modules jettisoned after they fire the motors, obviously to deorbit. And then this little bell part comes back through the atmosphere and has a heat shield and everything. So, so let's start sharing again. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, Soyuz 10 um, uh, latched on the station, but they couldn't retract the probe to open a hatch. And, uh, they're kind of stuck there. So they, there was thinking that they would just jettison the orbital module, that little egg shaped thing on the front, leave it attached to the station and then just return uh, with the re-entry module. But they worked the problem over several hours and they managed to retract the pull probe, uh, pull away, and then they came home the next day. Uh, I remember, um, hearing about this on the news. Of course, it was the Soviet Union, everything was a secret. And they said the mission was a complete success. They docked with the station, but they couldn't get the door open. But it, nevertheless, it was a complete success. In fact, anytime there was a mission failure, uh, it was always a complete success. Um, on later missions to space stations, uh, the Soyuz craft they used didn't have the solar panels. It was just battery powered. So if anything went wrong, wrong in the docking, uh, they only had two days of power. So if they couldn't dock, they would come home right away and proclaim everything was a great success. So here's an artist's conception of the uh, Soyuz. You can see the docking probe at the front there, closing in on uh, the Soyuz station. In, uh, 
in June of 1971, they launched Soyuz-11. And uh, this is the crew of Soyuz-11. Uh, they were uh, Victor Patsayev, uh, Georgi uh, Dobrolsky, probably saying that wrong, and Vladislav Volkov. And uh, this is a picture of them taken in uh, one of their training uh, uh, simulators of the Soyuz uh, capsule. This is taken, would have been taken inside the reentry. Uh, module. And you'll notice they're not wearing spacesuits. The Soyuz was a very cramped, and it still is a very cramped uh, spacecraft. And uh, in the 19th, in the early 1970s, uh, it was so cramped that they, uh, they couldn't get three guys in there wearing spacesuits. So they would, they would go up in, in uh, track suits. It wasn't until the uh, Soyuz T uh, later on, uh, I think 1979 is when it first flew, uh, where they uh, uh, went to full solid state electronics, they was, which gave them more room inside the Soyuz and they could get three guys in there with spacesuits again. And I mentioned that because um, on the, uh, after 23 days uh, on board uh, Salyut 1, they came back. Uh, and they came back on June the 30th, 71. And this is Soyuz 11 on the ground. When Soyuz 11 re-entered the atmosphere, um, uh, the process is all automatic. Everything looked good. Uh, the craft landed uh, automatically, came through the atmosphere, parachute came out, everything looked good. However, there was no communication with the crew. And when recovery crews opened the hatch, they found the crew was dead. And uh, so they pulled them out and they attempted to resuscitate them, but it, it was just too late. There was nothing more they could do. Uh, there was a state funeral for the three cosmonauts. Uh, and an investigation revealed that when the orbital module was jettisoned, uh, there was a pressure equalization valve that was supposed to open uh, when the uh, reentry module was well inside the atmosphere and it was designed to uh, re um, uh, balance the atmosphere outside with what was going on inside. Well, it opened up while they were still in space. And the atmosphere vented out into space, and uh, the three uh, cosmonauts uh, died. Um, from then on, uh, Salyut 1 uh, was deorbited to reenter the atmosphere and crashed into the Pacific. Um, and then other Salyut space uh, stations that were launched uh, further uh, only had two man crews. The two men always wore pressure suits on launch and uh, reentry until, like I say, the Soyuz T-series came out in the late 70s. So that's our space history, a bit on the sad note, I'm afraid. And that was 50 years ago this month. So I always reference Heavens Above. It's a great resource uh, for, well, just about anything you want to know. When, uh, when the moon is up, when the sun is up, what planets are up, what satellites are up, all sorts of stuff. Our next What's Up is going to be on July the 7th. Um, the 30th, uh, I thought of doing it on the 30th, but it's the day before Canada Day. Canada is on a Thursday, and I think a lot of people might be taking an extra long weekend. I might be doing that too. Um, so I'm going to push back to the 7th. And uh, also, I'll remind you that our uh, next general meeting of the RASC is on June the 14th. And Alistair Ling, who normally joins us, but not tonight, uh, is going to do his introduction to stargazing. And I'm not sure if he's going to do it on the 16th or the 23rd, but there will be a notice on our website. All these times are at 7.30 Mountain Daylight Time. So with that, I will say thank you and ask if there's any questions. I got a question. Yeah, sure. The noctilucent clouds, are they always in the west? No, they're always in the north. Okay. They're in the north. Uh, they'll start at sunrise in, in kind of in the northwest, and then through the night they'll drift over to the northeast because the sun is moving uh, uh, beneath the horizon. 
from the west and to the east. And, and then when it comes up in the northeast, um, the clouds will be above that. You know, sometimes the displays, um, most of the time the displays are, hang around the horizon. Um, they might get up about 10 degrees, but sometimes they get up like 40, 50, 60 degrees. Yeah. Almost, and and some, sometimes I've seen them almost directly overhead. Uh, but yeah, they're always going to be in the north. Okay. Is there any kind of um, an alert system for them? When, Not when for NLCs, no. You know, there. Um, it's uh, it would be kind of nice if there was. Maybe because it's only got about a two and a half month window. We don't have a warning system like we do for Aurora Watch. Okay. Thanks. And uh, oh, I see lots of things on the chat. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, oh, and I see someone from BC. Well, welcome, welcome. It's good to see uh, people from other parts of the country. Oh, the hockey game must be over. They're showing uh, Vegas and Colorado now. So I wonder who won. <laughs> I have the TV on in the background here. So anyway, um, so if there's nothing else, uh, I will say, uh, Thank you once again, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in uh, on uh, July 7th. Uh, hope you have a good June. Have, have a good Happy Canada Day. And uh, we'll see you. So thanks okay. very much.